Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to work towards a calculational tool for the fundamental group. It's the most important calculational tool for the fundamental group and it's called Van Kampen's theorem. Essentially everything we learn about fundamental groups is going to come from this theorem. But this theorem involves a little bit of algebraic machinery and maybe a delve into some groups you haven't seen before. So we'll start with that. Let's get to it. So here's our goal. Um, given groups G and H, we want to form a group which basically is some amalgamation of both of the groups together. So it contains both spaces. So here's one way to do this. Uh, well, you could form the direct product of the groups. And I'm sure you've seen this before. But this is sort of not applicable to what we want here. In some sense, the direct product is not the most natural object containing both of those groups. And here's why. Um, if G1 is in G and let's say H1 is in H, then these elements actually commute. G1, H1 is equal to H1, G1 inside of G cross H. So in some sense, we, we haven't formed the purest thing. There's some extra stuff, which is com commutati commutativity. Uh, here's an example where this will kind of be a problem. Uh, so this won't work for something like the wedge of two circles. So Van Kampen's theorem is going to let me build the fundamental group of this wedge out of the fundamental group of each of the pieces. And here uh, we've learned that the fundamental group of each of these little constituent circles is cyclic. Let me call their generators A and B. A is the circle on the left, B is the circle on the right. Uh, and here, the loop AB in homotopy is not equal to the loop BA in the fundamental group of this wedge. So we need something else, and this is called the free product. Let's start building it. So let G alpha for alpha in some indexing set I be a list of groups. Uh, this could be finite, it could be infinite. Um, in most of the cases we're dealing with, it'll be finite, but nevertheless, it doesn't need to be. So a word in G alpha is just a, a finite sequence of length m greater than or equal to zero. So I'll allow a zero length word, the empty word, uh, of elements in G alpha. So like I mentioned, if m is equal to zero, we call the word, the empty word. So I'm going to define a multiplication on words in a set of groups. So we define multiplication by concatenation. So 
for example, if I have uh, G1, G2, so it's a list. This is an element of, um, this is a word. And I want to multiply it by G3, G4, G5. I form a new list and I got G1, G2, G3, G4, and G5. So we're on our way to a group. Note that the empty word is an identity for this multiplication. If I append nothing onto a list, it's obviously the same list, right? But it doesn't seem like we have inverses. So this is not a group yet. And you can see this, like if, if a list has some finite length, which is not zero, multiplying it by any other list will just make the list grow in size. So we need to impose some relations on these lists here in order to allow the lists to shrink. So uh, if G I and G I plus one are in the same group and one alpha is the identity in G alpha, then we define what are called elementary reductions there's two of them the first is if i have a word of the form g1 g2 all the way up to gi comma gi plus 1 comma all the way up to gm this can be transformed back and forth to G1, G2, uh, GI minus 1, comma. And now GI and GI plus 1 live in the same group. And there's a multiplication defined there. So I can just replace the element, the two elements, GI, GI plus 1, by their product, GI times GI plus 1. And then I continue along. So that's one thing I can do. And the other is a little less exciting. If ever I see the identity element somewhere, let's see, let's say I see it here at G I minus one. I can just remove it. G one, G two, up to G I minus one. I, I just remove the identity element and I get G I plus one and so on and so forth. So two words are called equivalent if they can be transformed into each other by elementary reductions. So if they're related by elementary reductions. And now we do actually have inverses. So now if I have a list G1, G2 up to GM, I can actually get an inverse for it by uh, GM inverse, GM minus one inverse, all the way up to G1 inverse. This is the usual formula for inverting a product in a group. And you can see if you multiply these together, first you can pair off GM and GM inverse, and that's the identity, throw that away, and then keep going down and down and down until you just have the empty word. So 
we now have a group and this is called the free product. Let's write down the definition. So let G alpha for alpha in some indexing set be a collection of groups Then the free product, I'll write this as the star over alpha in I, G alpha, is the set of equivalence classes of words in G alpha under the operation of concatenation. So by equivalence classes, I mean equivalence classes under uh, these elementary reductions. So uh, that's the notation in general. Um, let's just make a couple notational remarks. We usually drop the parentheses. It's just burdensome to write them. And we also write G star H for the product of two groups. And if you have three groups, you can write G star H star uh, I, so on and so forth. So here's, here's a fun example. I really like this group. Let's take two copies of Zmod2 uh, generated by A and B, respectively. So I have a group that's generated by A. A squared is 1. There's another group generated by B with B squared being one. Uh, now, Z mod two, free product Z mod two, consists of elements that look like, okay, so think about it for a second, right here, a squared is 1, and in the other copy of Zmod2, B squared is 1. So I can never in a word have A twice in a row. I might as well throw that out. So I need to alternate, like A, B, A, B, A, B, so on and so forth, or B, A, B, A, B, A, so on and so forth. And this can end, either of them can end on an A or a B, but it always alternates between A and B. So you could see the sharp contrast with the Cartesian product of groups here. The Cartesian product consists of four elements, whereas the free product is actually an infinite group. Great. So here's a, um, a very fundamental example, an important class of free product are what are called free groups of rank N. And these are often called Fn. They are formed by taking the infinite cyclic group Z, free product with Z, free product with Z, so on and so forth. And I call this the free group of rank N, if you do this N times. And the reason they are so important, we'll, we'll see this shortly, is that every finitely generated group is a quotient of these free groups. So let's work towards that. 
Let S be a set. If uh, alpha is in S, then we can form an infinite cyclic group generated by alpha. And I'll use this notation. Two brackets is the infinite cyclic group generated by an element. Now let the group freely generated by S, that's what these brackets mean, be the free product over alpha in S of this infinite cyclic group, the group generated by alpha. So I, I said this, but let's just write it down. We call this the free group generated by S. So a lot of the objects we've been encountering can be defined in terms of commutative diagrams and free groups are no exception. Here's a theorem. I won't prove it, but it's, it's not too hard. It's called the characteristic property of free groups. It says that uh, if S is a set, let S be a set. Uh, now for any group H and any set map phi from S to H, there exists a unique homomorphism phi twiddle from the free group generated by S into H, which extends phi. Uh, let me just write this down in a diagram. So the uh, the set S includes into the group generated by S. And I'm starting with a map phi. And this characteristic property tells me that there always exists this map phi twiddle from the group generated by S into H. This is not always, I mean, it's usually not true for an arbitrary group because uh, th there's extra properties you would need for this set map to extend into a group map. It would need to play by all the group's rules. So here's a particular instance of this. So let G be a finitely generated group. And let G1 to GN be a generating set. Now, the set map G1 GN goes into G induced by the inclusion or it's not even induced, it's just given by the inclusion, extends to a map of the free group generated by G1 to GN into G. And, well, you could think about what the map is in the previous case. It's just uh, you know multiplication of all the elements. And since this is a generating set, this extended map is surjective.
I mean, yeah, it just boils down to the fact that G1 to GN is a generating set. So, anytime you have a surjective map in group theory, you have an isomorphism. Uh, that's the first isomorphism theorem. I'm not saying a surjective map is an isomorphism. I'll write down exactly what I mean. Now, by the first isomorphism theorem, different authors call this um, different things, but this is how I learned it. Uh, if I take the free group on n generators and I mod out by R, I get G. What's R? Well, R is the kernel of this phi twiddle. I'll, I'll call this uh, extension here, phi twiddle. So there you have it. Every finitely generated group is a quotient of the free group. Now what we want to do is sort of turn this on its head. I want a constructive way to, to see this. I want to build a group sort of out of a quotient of a free group. So here's the definition of that. Let S be a set and R be a set of words in S. So just a list of elements in S. Then the group given by the presentation so the notation is bracket S line R. So you read this as the group generated by S subject to the relations R. So is the group Well, I take the free group on S and I mod out by N. What's N? N is the normal closure. You can only mod out by normal groups in order to get a group, right? So this is this is the, the smallest normal group containing R. Normal closure of uh, R in S. So I take a bunch of these words, I take the group generated by them, and then I make it normal, and then I quotient out by that. So here's some uh, just notational things. So sometimes we write uh, x, y, so x is equal to y for x, y inverse is a word in R. And sometimes we write x is equal to 1 for just x is in R. Let me give you some examples of this. It's going to make a lot more sense once we have some concrete examples. So z mod 2z is generated by a single element a. What do I need that a to uh, satisfy? I just need a squared to be equal to 1. So there you have it. That's a presentation of z mod 2z. I really like these objects. It really just lays a group out there bare for you to understand. So how about z cross z? This is given by A and B, so that A, B is equal to B, A. Some of these actually require a proof. For, this is not obvious, but uh, it, it sort of feels obvious. You have two generators here, and they commute, and really that's all that's going on inside of Z cross Z. Uh, the free product, Z free product Z, 
is A and B with no relations at all. I don't need to quotient out the free group by anything to get the free group. And this is some sense in which it is free. It has no relations in it. And how about our dihedral group? So remember, this is like the symmetries of an n-gon. There's an element r, like rotation. And there's also an element s, which is like reflection. And if I rotate n times, I'm back at the identity. And if I flip twice, I'm back at the identity. And then there's one more interesting relation, which is that if I flip and then I rotate, as, uh, or rather this is rotate and then flip, R, S, uh, this is the same thing as R to the N minus 1 and then S. So one nice feature about group presentations is that they play very nicely with the free product operation. Here, this proposition makes this precise. So let G be uh, G1 to Gn, so those are the generators, and let it have relations Rg. And similarly, let's take a group with uh, presentation H1 to Hm with relations Rh. Then the free product is basically the simplest thing you can cook up. Just smash the generators together. So my new generators are G1 to Gn and H1 to Hm. And my new relations are all of the relations in G and all of the relations in H. So something to notice here is that the group elements that came from G just don't interact with the group elements that came from H. There's no crossover between the relations in G and the relations in H. Just as a concrete example, if I take the dihedral group on four uh, vertices, and I free product it with z mod 2z. Well, I just write the generators from before. R and S are going to generate my dihedral group. And A is going to generate my cyclic group of order 2. And I just essentially have all of the same relations as before. So R to the fourth is 1. S squared is 1. SR is R cubed S. And A squared is 1. Something kind of neat you can see here is that the free product on two elements is a subgroup here, and it's the subgroup generated by A and S. So all of this is building up towards a topological result, and the topological re result we would like is that if X is a union of two subspaces A and B, then there's a map from the fundamental group of the free product of each of those smaller spaces into the fundamental group of the large space, which is surjective. That's the important bit. Now, why would you want something like this? Well, the overall goal is to understand the fundamental group of X. Now, maybe it's built out of smaller spaces, A and B, whose fundamental group I understand. This at least lets me get a handle on what the generators are for the fundamental group of X, for example. Uh, if this map is surjective, then I shoot over generators from pi 1 of A and pi 1 of B under this homomorphism, and I would get generators for the fundamental group of X. And that ne this next proposition is going to allow us to do this. If phi alpha is a map from G alpha into H for each alpha, so this is a collection of homomorphisms, then there exists a unique extension I'll just call this phi from the free product over alpha of G alpha into H so what's what's the idea here Uh, so suppose I have phi of G1 up to Gm with Gi is in uh, the group Gi. 
Well, phi of g1 to gm needs to be, just because it's a homomorphism, phi of g1, phi of g2, uh, to phi of gm. And, well, what do I call phi of g1? Well, I have a map phi1 going from the group containing g1 into h. So let's just do that. Phi1 of g1, phi2 of g2, all the way up to phi m of gm. You can see that this restricts to each of the original phi i's on the group gi. And uh, this is a homomorphism. And there you have it. That's the unique extension. So what does this mean for us topologically? Well, given a space X written as the union over alpha in some indexing set J, A alpha, with, let's just say there's a base point X naught in A alpha for every alpha. So all of these sets contain the base point. Now, the inclusion maps I alpha from A into X. Any map induces a map on the fundamental group. In particular, these do. So they induce maps I alpha star from pi 1 of a into pi 1 of x with this base point x naught. So we get a map by our previous thing. We have a collection of homomorphisms. And so we get a map of the free product. I'll call this capital I from the free product over alpha of pi 1 of a alpha into pi 1 of x. So this is the map we want to analyze. Here is a lemma. We're going to impose some more restrictions on these a alphas that's going to let us say something. Let x be equal to the union over alpha and j of a alpha, where a alpha is path connected, open, and contains the base point x naught for all alpha. then every loop in X based at X naught can be written, let me be more precise, is homotopic to a loop which is a product of loops each of which is contained in a single A alpha. So maybe you want to pause here and absorb that statement. It'll, it'll make sense. Uh, so we, we have a loop that goes all over the place in X, and we're saying we can tame it a little bit so that it's a bunch of loops, each of which live in these smaller subsets. So this is going to be one of the longer proofs, but it's, all, it's very nice and geometric. So let f from i to x be a loop based at x0. Now, since f is continuous, that's the definition of loop, and a alpha is open, 
for every alpha. F inverse of A alpha, this union over all of the alphas, is a union of open intervals covering I. So what's what's the idea here? Well, the whole space X is built out of A alpha. So the entire image of the interval lies in X, which means it must be sort of tiled by these A alphas. So we've used this fact before. I is what's called compact. So every open cover of I has a finite subcover. So at first, there were all these sets, maybe infinitely many, covering the interval. But now, since I is compact, we can break this up into nice little intervals. And we could even tailor them off at the end there so that at each of these sub-intervals labeled AI, the loop lives ex entirely within AI. So we split 0, 1 into intervals 0, S1, uh, union, S1, S2, union, all the way up to S m minus 1 sm so that f of si minus 1 si which I will define to be fi lives entirely within a specific open set ai so what we have now is F is homotopic to F1 concatenated with F2 concatenated with so on concatenated up to Fn. The next step is to make these into loops. I'll draw a picture here which may clarify the previous bit too. So this big thing here is A1, this here is A2, both of them contain the base point x0, and my loop starts in, uh, whoop, since I called this one A1, let me start here, starts here, F1, and then continues back over here with F2. This isn't exactly what we want. We want loops contained in A1 and loops contained in A2. So here's the idea. I'm gonna call this here G1. It's a path going like this. And I'll call this path here G2, which is, uh, well, I'll call it G1 bar because that's what it is. It's G1 just going in the opposite direction. And these are paths to the base point. So now F1 composed with G1 is a loop and G1 bar composed with F2 is a loop. This is a loop in A1, 
That whole loop is contained in A1. And this thing is a loop in A2. And that's essentially going to be our strategy. So since a I is path connected, we're all I, there's a path from f of si to the base point. x naught. Let's call it uh, g i. Now recall that g i g i bar is homotopic to the identity. So Okay, let's put this all together. F is homotopic to F1 times F2 times all the way up to Fm. And I can insert these little paths. So this is homotopic to F1 times G1 times G1 bar times F2 times G2 times, okay, let's do one more, G2 times, oh, G2 bar times F3 times G3, all the way up to uh, GM minus one bar FM. So the idea is that these are gonna cancel. And this is a loop in a1, this is a loop in a2, and so on and so forth. And there we have it. So every loop f can be expressed as a1 composed with A2, composed all the way up to AM with AI in this particular component, uh, AI. So here's a corollary. Note that these are all in the image of the inclusion map of AI into X. So as a corollary, the map I from the free product of alpha pi one of A alpha to pi one of X is surjective under the conditions above. Again, the idea is that this AI here is the inclusion of AI in pi one of X. And since every element of pi one of X is a product like this, this map is surjective. All right, now by the first isomorphism theorem, pi one of x is some quotient of the free product over alpha of a alpha. And the quotient is by the kernel of this big inclusion map. So our next goal is to understand this kernel. So what is in the kernel? of I. 
Well, suppose we want to look for things that we accidentally double counted. So suppose uh, omega is in A alpha intersect A beta. Well, the maps I alpha beta star, this is from pi 1 of A intersect beta into pi 1 of A, oh, so, sorry, A alpha intersect A beta into pi 1 of A alpha and I beta alpha star. So this one now goes from pi 1 of same input, A alpha intersect A beta. And now we land in pi 1 of A beta. Well, let me just draw a picture of this setup here. Suppose I have a sphere. And everything up to here, let's call that A alpha. And on the right, everything down to here, let's call that A beta. So here's a loop. W inside of A alpha intersect A beta. And I have these inclusion maps of the fundamental group, but really that's the same loop, right? So, so uh, these two maps carry W into omega into different groups And so different places in the free product of pi 1 of A alpha. So, so here, W is null homotopic. But it, in principle, it could have been an honest fundamental group element in both of those sets. And in this free product, it's counted twice. So by slight abusive notation, I'm going to call I alpha beta of W the element which is the image of uh, like I alpha star of I alpha beta star of W inside of pi 1 of x. So there's an inclusion map from the intersection into A alpha, and then there's a map from A alpha into x. And so follow that all along, and I get my uh, group element I alpha, beta, I alpha beta of w. Now, I alpha beta of w is equal to I al beta alpha of w in pi 1 of x. They represent literally the same loop. So that's one thing we have to keep in, in uh, keep track of. So we need the relation, like this is in the kernel of that free group, so we need the relation i alpha beta of w times i beta alpha of W inverse is equal to one. It turns out that's everything. So uh, for to, to normally generate the kernel, here is the theorem, the main theorem of today's class. It's called the Van Kampen theorem. Van Kampen's theorem. Sometimes it's also called the Seifert Van Kampen theorem. So suppose X is a union 
of path connected spaces A alpha so that X is the union over all the alpha. Let's get a mixing set J of A alpha. Also suppose that for all alpha, beta, and gamma in J, A alpha intersect A beta and A alpha intersect A beta intersect A gamma are path connected. Okay, so we get two conclusions. Then the map, capital I from before, of the free product of pi one of the A alphas into pi one of X is surjective. So that's part one. And the kernel of I is normally generated by elements of the form I alpha beta of W, I beta alpha of W for W in the fundamental group of A alpha intersect A beta. So in particular, pi one of X is the free product over alpha of pi one of A alpha over N, where N is the normal closure of I, of um, kernel ah. of, of elements like this. Great, so that form is honestly a little bit tricky for me to understand. I like to get my hands on things. So let me give you Van Kampen's theorem as, as I think of it. Which is in terms of group presentations. So let X be equal to A. This is a, a easier statement, just two sets. X is A union B with A and B path connected. And A intersect B path connected. Oop. So I just want to make sure. Uh, I forgot to mention it's actually very important that these spaces need to be open. So we'll have the same thing here. Uh, and A and B are open. So let the fundamental group of a be given by a presentation A1 to AN with relations R and pi one of B B B1 to BM with relations S, then the fundamental group of X is given by this presentation A1 to AN B1 to BM with relations R, S, and then our extra relations 
let's just say pi one of a intersect b is c1 to cl with relations t well i get i a b of c1 i b a of c1 all the way up to i a b of c l c1 c1 inverse and then i a b i b a of c l inverse So it's all very concrete. You just throw the generators together, throw the relations together, and then in the intersection, anytime you double counted, mod out by that. So let's just do, the, the next class is gonna be entirely dedicated to applications of this theorem. It's a very deep and very far reaching theorem. Let's give one quick example and then we'll wrap up the video. So here is a theorem. The fundamental group of Sn is trivial for n greater than or equal to 2. And the proof is surprisingly easy once we have this theorem. So let's just set down some identifications. Sn is xn x1 to xn plus 1 and r n plus 1 with x1 squared plus all the way up to xn plus 1 squared being equal to 1. I'm going to break this up into two sets and I'll just draw it pictorially. So that's my sphere. I'm gonna have a set A, which is the Northern Hemisphere plus a little bit extra. And I'm gonna have a set B, which is the Southern Hemisphere plus a little bit extra. So let A be x1 to xn plus 1 in Sn so that xn plus 1 is uh, greater than or equal to 0.4 and let b be the same thing but now I'm going to insist that the last coordinate Oh, not less than or equal to, sorry. Just strictly greater than 0.4 before. And now we're going to be strictly less than 0.6. So as you can see, and you can uh, calculate this out if, if you'd like, A is homeomorphic to dn. B, not surprisingly, is homeomorphic to dn. A and B are path connected. A intersect B is path connected. And A and B are open. So we can apply Van Kampen's theorem. This is actually not going to come into play, but note that A intersect B is homeomorphic to S n minus one cross I. Here you can see it, there's an S one cross I, which is the equator plus a little bit on both sides. Now, by 
Van Kampen's theorem. Since pi 1 of a, well, it's, it's sort of given by this empty presentation. Uh, I'll just write that as the identity there. And this is also equal to pi 1 of b. Pi 1 of x is the free product of two copies of the trivial group modded out by something. But it, it sort of doesn't matter. If you take the free product of two trivial groups, you get something trivial. And of course here x is Sn. And there you have it. The sphere is simply connected if n is greater than or equal to 2. So that's going to do it for today. Here's something to test your understanding of Van Kampen's theorem. We know that the fundamental group of S1 is non-trivial. So see exactly where the proof that we just did breaks down for n is equal to 1. And if you understand that, you understand how to be careful with Van Kampen's theorem. I'll see you next time.